And now, it's The Law Show, a comprehensive look at everything you need to know about the law. We touched on some of the myths that um, uh, surround personal injury. Now, one I think is uh, quite interesting is the adjuster from ICBC is on your side. So you get into an accident, you go and you talk to them, and, and their, their MO is to kind of settle this and get it done quickly for the least amount possible, I'm guessing. ICBC wants to curtail costs. So, so what, what typically happens in these situations, and how have you seen them change from what the adjuster has provided from ICBC to what you end up settling for. Can you give us some examples? So what happens in that situation? So <clears throat> when a claim is open, an mm-hmm. adjuster gets assigned to it, and the adjuster will contact the, the person who was injured. <clears throat> and what you have to remember is that um, the adjuster is an employee of a big corporation, mm-hmm. and um, there are uh, very strict standards that are set for the employee's performance standards. And one of the things that uh, the adjuster is evaluated on at year's end is how little or how much money they have paid out to people. So they get bonuses based on how little they pay out? Well, they don't get bonuses uh, necessarily, but it's that's part of the performance that they're judged on. And so that's, you know, it doesn't mean they're a bad person, but in the back of their mind, they're always thinking, I need to, to reduce the amount... Uh, and settle this claim for as little as I can. And and what people don't realize is that that adjuster isn't your adjuster. That adjuster, if it's a tort action and you've been injured and it's no fault of your own, is representing the potential defendant or defendant's uh, insurance. But that's ICBC. They're the insurer. They're, well, in the, yeah, if it's an ICBC insured, they're defending the interest of the defendant, the person at fault for the accident. So they're trying to settle that claim. But isn't it almost a conflict of interest that they're they're double ending the deal here? They're representing themselves most of the time, and they're trying to settle with you as somebody who's injured. It's it's a very very weird system in BC because mm-hmm. when ICBC was created, mm-hmm. they were created as monopoly. And so when you um, have a claim, you, you're dealing with the same adjuster for your no-fault benefits, um, who's the same adjuster for the person that you're suing. So in other jurisdictions where there's no monopoly, there's all kinds of different insurance companies, the person you're suing is going to be represented by um, insurance company X, and you have your own insurance company who you're talking to to get your no-fault benefits. Mm-hmm. And there's no communication between the two, but in BC there is. Um, it's like in real estate, they got rid of that double ending. Yeah. You can't buy and sell a house for somebody. So in ICBC's case, that still goes on. Uh, and uh, we're not saying that it's, that it's wrong, but it's just, it's a strange system. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so when you have an adjuster come and sit next to you and say, and they, and they put a number in front of you, listen, we'll give you this amount of money for your whiplash or whatever it is, um, soft tissue injury. Um, what are they trying to do? They're trying to get it down to as low a number as possible? Uh, they're putting offers forward, uh, usually fairly early, um, to people who are involved in accidents that's no fault of their own to try to get rid of them quickly. Because if this injury, and it might be unbeknownst to that person who's about to sign the release, uh, could be a long lasting injury. And ICBC is trying to get you to sign that release before you even know that. Then you're off the hook for the the treatment, the part sevens, and they're not going to be liable for a large, potentially large, you know, uh, tort claim, which would include loss of enjoyment of life, uh, l- loss of future earning capacity, future cost of care, and and so on. And they must come across as being your like friend. They're, they're your friend. They're, yep. the, the nicest adjusters are the the first line of defense, essentially. <laughs> yeah. um, and and people have pleasant conversations with them uh, at the start, and that's how they're trained. And um, it's essentially their goal in the end is to hey, this you know the the person thinks hey, this adjuster is giving me some free treatment, which you're entitled to anyway, whether you're at fault for yeah. the accident or not, and people just don't understand Part 7 benefits, well, they're being very nice, and on top of that, they're going to give me $5,000 or $10,000, you know, just a couple weeks after the accident. That sounds great at the time, but the reality is when you get a lawyer to assess it, and we argue and negotiate, I shouldn't say argue, negotiate with ICBC uh, on their behalf, looking at all these various heads of damage, and I mentioned a few, uh, such as loss of enjoyment of life, uh, past wage loss, loss of future earning capacity, future cost of care, loss of housekeeping capacity, special damages. Well, before I became a personal injury lawyer and most lay people out there, 
don't even know about these heads of damages and really have no business trying to quantify what their claim is worth. You must get some people that that's an enormous amount of money. $10,000 can solve a lot of their financial problems, get rid of their credit card debt and all that kind of stuff. And ICBC realizes that and, and preys on those people for an early settlement. And so when you come in and you say this is going to take a year maybe mm-hmm. and uh, they're looking at $10,000 now, that's a tough argument on your part, I'm sure. It is. But when we, for example, I'll say we have a, we've had clients in that come to us and we see a potential large claim. You know, for example, someone who's a, uh, a few years ago, I had a, a construction worker yeah, who I was, was off say, can work you give for us, a significant amount of, of time. Yeah, can you give us an example of what maybe ICBC put forward and then where you ended up? Sure, of course. And and for this, this, this fella came in and he, he met with me and he didn't actually end up retaining us because he was offered the $10,000. And I said, well, you know, you're a construction worker. Uh, you're still off of work at this t- point of time. Um, you, you, going forward, maybe with your, he has a grade 10 education. He's really just been relying to earn his income off of his, his, his physical attributes. Mm-hmm, sure. And he's, is, and he, he's about to settle his claim for $10,000. And we don't know that perhaps he has to go for retraining and completely cannot do this type of work anymore. Perhaps mm-hmm. he has to take a lower paying job. He was, you know, uh, going up to Fort Mac and, and making a, a, a killing, doing some tough work up there. And, and now he, he can't do that work anymore. And he has to go work at maybe McDonald's or can't even do that because he can't stand for prolonged periods of time. We don't know, but I explained the risk to the, the person. But uh, because of their situation, they just go and sign that release. And so you know, do you they have lost any- a potentially large claim. 